Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, that you know each one of us and what we go through. And sometimes, Lord, you take us through the hard things to teach us things. And then sometimes, Lord, you give us the blessings to encourage us. And thank you, Lord, that in all of that, we can trust you. And Lord, just always keep our hearts right before you. And let us see your hand, Lord, in all of our lives. And trust you in Jesus' name, amen. This, sec this uh, session, we're going to talk about that and God in the children of Israel's life all along the way. Turn to Joshua 24. Joshua is giving his final message, his farewell to the children of Israel. This is his third one in a couple chapters where he has talked to them. I talked to the tribes on the other side of the Jordan that were there, the three and a half tribes, and then he talked to the leadership, and now he's talking to this, this group on this particular day. And what he's really saying through this chapter is remember the past. Remember how important it is. We have to learn from our past. And those who don't repeat their mistakes, right? History, it says, is a vast early warning system. And those who cannot remember the past are bound to repeat it. It's so fascinating to me that Anchesty.com is so popular, and people want to know about their past. It's TV shows are made out of it, and, and people are sending in their DNA, and we're finding out so many things. And I saw a documentary on Trump recently, and he was saying, I like to learn from mistakes. And uh, of course, probably other people's is how he would put it. But anyway, <laughs> okay. Anyway, he said, I like to learn from mistakes. Very wise. And um, you know how we always said, I, don't, I didn't let my children grow up drinking at all or drugs. And in the reason the documentary it told is that because his brother, he had one brother um, that he just adored, older than him, that would have taken the, his father's business. And um, he started drinking alcohol, and it consumed him. And he watched this good-looking older brother that he had and loved so much <laughs> die at 42 years old from alcohol. And so we learned from our mistakes. My mom had the same thing. She had a dad who would come home drunk on weekends. He was a furrier out in Minnesota, and he'd uh, work for a company. He'd come home on weekends, and the farmers would give him a bottle of something, and he'd come home drunk. And he was so mean on Saturday mornings, my mom just hated him. He didn't know the Lord, and, and in that she didn't, you know, have any alcohol in our home. And so whatever that is, we do need to learn. We watch others' lives and go, don't go there. They went there, and it was not a good thing. And so it's an important lesson, learning from our past. And so on this day, he's going to give them a history lesson. Now, I want you all to know this and your children to know this, all of you that he's really kind of raised up and, and led into battle, and their children, don't forget this. Don't forget the law, and don't forget this. Because I think when we look at the miracles, either in Scripture or in our lives today, it is a great encouragement to us that God is big and he's powerful. And when I hit things in my life that I'm not sure what's going to happen, if I start looking at the miracles and I meditate on them, it encourages me for today. He's big enough to do that. I remember one time we were dealing with a marriage that was just a mess. Don was counseling them, and I knew about the situation. I remember going to bed that night, and I'd just been reading about Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and turned off the light and was laying there thinking, you know, Lord, I know you can do anything, but that marriage, I don't think you can do. It is such a mess. It's just pretty a hopeless one. I don't think you can do it. <laughs> and I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, the Lord just, like, speaks to my heart and says, if I can raise Lazarus from the dead, I can heal a marriage. And I've never forgotten it. And you know what? The Lord healed that marriage, and they got back together, and last I heard, they were doing fine and happy. And so I think we need to meditate on the miracles. 
And that's what Joshua did on this day. Deuteronomy 29, 5 says, I have led you for 40 years in the wilderness, you children of Israel. Your clothes have not worn out, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You know, that's a lot of people going across the desert, and there were no TJ Maxx's, there were no Marshalls, there were no Nordstrom's, Walmarts. You know, so what a great thing God thought of. Let's just help them cleave the clothes they had. There was no shopping problems with the credit card. <laughs> it was just like, and then, you know, we fed them every day. And then with the thirsty, he brought water. And when the enemy came, he defeated him. Their only problem was themselves when they would doubt or complain. And it's a great lesson to look at. God met every one of their needs. And that's what he's going to talk to them about. And in this chapter, in the very beginning, he has given these talks to the people, these last messages, and on this very last and third message that he's giving the children of Israel, it says, thus saith the Lord. And so we know as Joshua is giving these words, God is speaking through him. So the Lord is saying that. Previously in his message has been emphasis on the land and the nation and emphasis on the Lord. But in this chapter, the Lord is mentioned 21 times and serving is mentioned 15 times. So they're, they're pretty important. In all these messages, Joshua tells them, you must be faithful for the Lord and you must fervently obey him. So that's key. And then you need to know who he is and you need to see what he's done. There were three major cities in those days that were important as they were taking over the land. And one was Shechem and Shiloh and Gilgal, remember? They came over and they landed in Gilgal, and that's where Joshua parked the military. And when they go out to battle, they'd come back to Gilgal to get refreshed and then go on out again. And so that was um, 350 years later, used by Samuel as a center for administration. And it's a beautiful picture of coming back and resting before quiet, uh, God in our quiet time, of coming back and regathering the troops before we go out again. And Shiloh was the next city, and that was their religious center. That's where they put the, um, the tabernacle and, and so many things that happened there. That's where they would bring their sacrifices to worship in Shiloh. Remember, Samuel came out of there, that um, his mother had come to Shiloh to worship and had asked the Lord for a child, and God gave her Samuel, and what a change that made in Israel. And the ark was taken from there. It was planted there, and it was taken by the Philistines in that battle with with Levi's son. So Shiloh becomes a picture of really where grace abounds and God's grace with the tabernacle and all that happened there to responsibility is required for that. And Eli and his sons were not responsible and thus the ark was taken to the camp of the Philistines for a period of time. Then there's Shechem. This is the third and this is the place where he is having the meeting on this day, his final message. It was actually closer to where Joshua lived in the land that he had near Shiloh, than Shiloh was. It was on a valley floor between two mountains and it was that place where Joshua in the beginning of this whole taking over the land had caused, called Israel together and given them the law, remember? And there was the blessings and the cursings and if you do this, God will bless you and if you do that, you know, and the law was all put before him. And so it was this great area where in this valley with these two mountains, it was like an amphitheater. So if he would speak, the people, this huge crowd of people could hear him. Then he goes into the history here. I'm not gonna read the whole chapter, but your fathers in verse two, and Joshua said to all the people, thus saith the Lord of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, that was Abraham, remember his, grand, his father, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor dwelt on the other side of the river, which would have been the Euphrates in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Sir to Bezos. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. I also sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I, I brought them out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea of the Egyptians. 
pursued you, your fathers, with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea upon them and covered them, and your eyes saw it. What I did to Egypt, your eyes saw. And when you dwelt in the wilderness a long time, 40 years, and I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you, but I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land. And I destroyed them before you. When Balak and the son of Zippor, king of Nohab, rose to make war against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Er, to curse you, but I would not let Balaam. Therefore, he continued to bless you, so I delivered you out of his hand. And then you went over the Jordan, and you came to Jericho. And the man of Jericho fought against you, also the Amorites, the Perizzites, and all of the other ites. And I delivered them. I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow, but I have given you a land for which you did not labor, cities for which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. What an amazing story. And he goes on to say, you choose this day who you serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Joshua is a pretty unique person. You know, when Moses, the Lord told Moses, I want you to put Joshua in charge. And Moses was a pretty unique person. Unbelievable. And yet we see Moses' failures. I mean, one time he wanted to kill Israel and the other time God did. They were so mad at the Israelites and all their problems. It was a hard job Moses had. And he couldn't go in the land because he disobeyed God at that point when he struck the rock twice. But we don't see any of that with Joshua, and not that Moses was worse. He was certainly an incredible human being that God used. He says he was the meekest of any man. And yet, look what happened from God through his hands and all that he did. I stood a year ago. I stood uh, a year and a half. I stood by that sea, by the sea that they crossed the, when the Egyptians were chasing them, the Red Sea. Have you ever been there, Elot? It's huge. Were you shocked at how huge it was? I thought, it's so blue, it's as deep as the ocean. And it's not as big as the ocean, but you look across this great body of water, and I'm thinking, how in the world did God build up the sides of that and let them walk through? And they didn't just walk through. They went through on dry ground. I mean, you take any water away from water beds, it's just all mucky for days, and it has to dry out. And, and so we look in this, and the thing that I wanted you to catch in this is, I did it, I did it, I did it, but God. But if God not a, had not interfered in their lives, there would be a whole different scenario. We wouldn't hear about them today. There'd be no Israel today. And God said, I did this, I did this. Can you see him? Can you see him in your life? Can you see the Lord saying, but I did this for you, and I brought you out, and I gave you your health, your husband, your family, and I gave you this difficult child because I'm allowing you to grow, and I gave you this congregation, and I gave you this situation. And when we look at life that way, it changes our whole perspective because we have to know that we can trust this God who's in charge of us. And this is the last charge. I thought about Joshua at this age, he says, I go the way of all the earth. We're all going to die. And I look at Joshua coming to that point and how he handled it. What would you say to the children of Israel? I thought, what would I say to them? If this was my last charge to them, you say the most important thing. And what would you say to them? It's so important, those words that we give people. And they're so precious to those that remember them. I remember the last words of my dad. He, he knew he was a doctor, and he knew that he had heart failure, and he knew his time was really short. He was pretty good at diagnosis. And I went to visit him, and um, I lived up in San Jose. He lived in Southern California, and I went to visit him, and he said, I don't have much time, and I just want you to know you've been a good daughter. And I, I just words of comfort to me. And I, I said, Dad, you're going. And he said, no, this is the way it's going to be. I'm going. 
and I want you to know this. I cannot tell you how many times through the years I've thought about those words. Because sometimes I'll think, I should have visited him more. I should have done this or that. And those words come back to me. I, I can't tell you what peace that gives me. You know, like, we're okay. <laughs> you know, he's, he's happy and we're okay. And God gives us those words. And, and, and sometimes people give us those words and they're very important. So it's important what you say to other people. It's really important because those are words you, they will remember you by. And we don't always know the last time we're going to see them. He tells Abraham that he had been called out. And the thing that really gripped me about this was that he had been raised by idol worshipers. I don't know that he didn't worship Bibles. I don't know what he did when he was young. But God put his hand on him and pulled him out and said, I'm calling you to this. And Abraham said, yes. He calls us and we have to say, yeah, if we say no, there's a different road. But he did. And it tells us in the New Testament what faith he had, how he left everything. Was he perfect? No. He was not perfect, and yet God called him his friend. And I think we're sinners too, and God loves us. And all we have to do is just turn over to him. And he loves us, and he can call us his friend. The Christian life means that we're called out from the world. We're set apart for God like Abraham was. He was called out from idol worship. He was set apart for God. He was going to be a whole nation unto himself. And the other thing for us is, and Abraham too, we have to be crucified with Christ. We have to die to our flesh. We're not perfect. We're not the boss of everybody. We have to know that we have to die to the flesh. Someone told me when I was young, Picture yourself in a coffin right here in front of the church. I'll just check it out. Can that person be offended? Can you, when you're dead, be offended? Nope. Okay, you're crucified with Christ. Let it go. That helped me a lot. Probably a ministry that will help you a lot to think of that. We have to serve the Lord with all of our hearts. And in this particular section of scripture, when Joshua is going to choose the Lord, it's a continuous word here, and it means continue to choose past, present, and future. I know people, you know, they say, well, we got saved, we got our ticket on the train to heaven, we're good. And, and you know them, and, and they don't choose every day. And, and so they, they fall away, or they, they distance, and they don't ever grow in their life. It's not a once and for all decision. It is to be saved. But daily you must choose to walk with him. And Abraham left everything. He brought Lot with him and his wife with him, and I don't know what goods he brought with him, but he left Ur of the Chaldees. And it wasn't an easy life. And sometimes the Lord calls you out to do things that maybe are not easy. And I want to say, uh, no, thank you. My mom said, honey, you'd never make a good missionary because you're just too queasy about food. I was picky. And, you know, and she said, you won't make a good missionary. And so the Lord has called me to America, which is fine. I can eat burgers and chicken stuff. But sometimes he calls me on mission trips. And last year he called me on one. And I have to tell you girls, honestly, this is true confessions. I did not want to go. It was South Sudan. And it wasn't about the food. It was about the terrorists. And we went to, um, to, to the missionary, Wes, and um, he showed us a whole spiel on what he did. He wanted us to come and see what he did on the mission field. And so we went, and he told horror stories about what Sudan, the Sudan, Sudanese do. They are absolute terrorists, Muslim terrorists, Islam, whatever it is. And they don't just kill people, they torture them. And, and they chop their heads off. And they do uh, things I don't even want to know, he told Don. And I go, I, don't, I, knew, I heard enough. And when he told me about chopping someone's head off, I thought, this is a good guy's trip. <laughs> Don, you should go. So I called my son Marcus. I said, you know, Dad's going to South Sudan. I think you should go with him. Uh, no, Mom, I like my life. <laughs> He's not gone. So, you know, I come home, and my other son, the kids are living with us at that point, Don, and he goes, you're not going there, are you? And I go, I don't know. Because John told me, he said, I'm going. You have to decide for yourself. 
if you want to go or not. But I am going because the Lord has told me. Wes had asked him for years to, uh, to go, and he just um, finally said, I know I have to go and do this. And so it's up to you. And so my son says, you're not going there. He said, Mom, do you understand that that's one of the worst countries in the world with terrorism? I go, I did not know this. Don't tell me this. <laughs> he looked at me, and finally he said, all right, well, just do me a favor. If you decide to go, I want you to write down all the important paperwork I need to know, like all your passwords before you leave town. <laughs> You're encouraging. Thank you so much. So I, I'm going through all this, and I'm thinking, I don't want to go. So I had my, my friends. I called my brother and my friends, and I said, would you just pray God gives me a verse? i got to have a verse if I'm going to go. And so they did. And the Lord gave me the verses. I'm reading my devotions. If you not go when I ask you to go, you're not worthy to be called my disciple. Okay. <laughs> the other one was, and if you will go and leave houses and lands and brothers and sisters and the whole schmo of your country, I'll give you a hundredfold. With persecutions, I marked that out in my mind on that part. I'll give you a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come. And I knew that I knew I had to go. And I suddenly had tremendous peace about it. But just before we left and we were getting all of our shots and all of the things you have to do and your pills gathered for whatever emergency, because it's like the germ center of the world, I think. And I, I just, I got to thinking about the mosquitoes and malaria. And I got, oh, great, I'm going to get malaria. It's not going to be the terrorists. It's going to be this little mosquito. I mean, we're so stupid. I, I just, like, worry about the, you know, and so I just go, but it's a real thing. And so I did all the stuff I had to do for the mosquito thing. I think they have you take an antibiotic or something. And we went. And I have to tell you, it was a trip of a lifetime that I will never forget. I think we're going to be going back and helping with planning churches, training pastors. And, but, but the thing was, in this whole trip, that was I thought God just smiled. I didn't get bit by one mosquito. And may I tell you, there were millions of them. I mean, mi millions. We sat there. They were surrounding us, and you know. I did not get one bite. And someone that was on that trip at the same time we were did get bit and did get malaria. So I know it was there. I got home, I got bit twice. So I knew I was delicious to them. But I just thought, that was a miracle. I mean, this is silly little things. I mean, it was big if I got malaria. I was not going to be happy with that. But I just thought, I'll give you a hundredfold in this life and the life to come. And I'll tell you, he gave me a hundredfold in this life many times. But on that trip, after we were done with the work and all that we did, and I got to go out to a village and teach women. I've got to tell you this one story. It's too good. I went out to this village. They're sitting in the dirt on the plastic lawn chairs. And they came. And they live in, I'm not kidding, right there, Tukalos. They are mud huts made out of mud and cow dung. They say that the cow dung keeps the bugs out. They didn't smell bad, but they were just like round and thick walls and grass roofs. And they started coming out from the village. And they were all dressed up, the women. And uh, Wes's wife took me, and she said, I teach this study. I want you to do it today. And, and so I, I told them the story about Hezekiah coming over the hill, and all the enemy was dead. Remember that? They came over the hill singing, and all that Jehoshaphat was Jehoshaphat. And they were all dead, and I told them that story. Because they're living with terrorists next door here, you know. And afterwards, they all were dressed to the hilt in whatever they had in their hut. Ironed and pressed, beautiful colors. Maybe they were old and worn, and maybe they were even torn. But they dressed up. And they came, and they sat there, the young and the old and the babies, playing in the dirt. And they said... Thank you so much for coming. And Wes's wife said, they'll never forget you came. For years to come, if you were to come back, they would remember you. They will not forget this. And they said, thank you so much for coming. You made us so happy. And I remember they would, they would share a little bit, because that's what they do there. After I'm through, then you all get to talk. Isn't that nice? <laughs> and so I just love listening to them. And this little grandma on the end of the row, older, <laughs> and they stand up. And she, thank you so much for coming. It's meant so much. And she said, after I'd read this or told the story to them, she said, and they all had Bibles. And she said, the soldiers were coming. 
and I hid under the bushes. Now we're talking soldiers that do horrible things to you. And I hid under the bushes and I prayed to Jesus that he wouldn't let them see me and they passed me by. And I thought, I'm telling the story of the Bible and she's living it. And I just was so blessed with how the Lord watches over us. And, and I would have to say, I, the Lord, led you to South Sudan. And I, the Lord, kept the mosquitoes away. And I, the Lord, let you see these people that are so hungry for Jesus. We went into a village school, a public school, surrounded by the huts where the people sent their children, at least a 1,000 kids in the school. A mission team was in there working with them for a whole week, and in the end, they gave them backpacks. It's probably the only gift they'll ever get. They don't get Christmas and birthdays. They're poor. They have a cow or a goat, and they work a little land in these country areas. And, and so they gave them a backpack, and then Wes got up and gave his testimony and asked how many of them would like to ask Jesus in their heart, grade school. I think every kid in the school, over 1,000 kids, raised their hand. And we need to send churches and pastors to them. And so I got to see that on the other side of the earth. And I thought, Lord, you are doing this for them. I brought you here. I want to minister to these people. I want these children saved. There's a great work going on in spite of all the mess that's going on in the world today in these last days. Just as Satan is working, Jesus is working. And so he goes through Abraham, he goes through each one of these characters in the scripture, and he's telling them in each one, I did it, I did it, I did it. Joshua was telling him, you better listen to this, because you will need to know this. And he tells them about all the situations. And you have to know that as they came out of some of these things, the idols were horrible idols that the children of Israel that God brought them away from. I, I brought them out of Ur of the Chaldees. And Ur of the Chaldees had, had idols, you know, just terrible idols. And Egypt had bad ones. And all of these places, it was just difficult. And these idols were cruel oftentimes. We saw last night how they cut themselves before Baal. And the Egyptians, I thought, was very interesting because when he, God sent the plagues, it went right against their idols because they had idols that were the gods of the Nile, which was the river. What kind of plague did God send them? The river turned to blood. The land, all the things that happened on the land and the sky, and Pharaoh was one of their gods. And what happened to Pharaoh's family? And I believe what God was saying and all those things he did at that moment in Jesus, in uh, Egypt, was to show Israel and the Egyptians, there is no God but Jehovah. I am, and I am over all of those gods that they think are gods in their land, and I have power over all of that. You know, it, the scripture is just like a little nugget, and then it goes so deep. It's like the tip of the iceberg as you look at some of these things. And then he brought him out of the Red Sea, and I just love that part where he put a black cloud between them, and the Egyptians couldn't get to him. And then the other part was really kind of fascinating is that they were stuck. They were in an area where there was no way out. There was a ravine coming in where the Egyptian army was, and there was the Red Sea. How would you feel if you were staying there with your three little kids? Would you be kind of sick? Oh, God, you better help us. <laughs> And then to see this enormous miracle. And Joshua says in this chapter, he brought you through, he brought you through the Red Sea and they drowned, all your enemies drowned and you saw it. Because some of them were little kids when that happened. You saw it. And God just did the most unbelievable miracles. And through the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief, Because God certainly can't take the giants, they said. Only Caleb and Joshua brought the good news. Forty years, he kept them fed. Grace. Grace from God. And gave them water. Then he destroyed the Amorites before him. He brought them there. And then Moloch was a horrible god of the Amorites. He was the god who involved prostitution. And on top of that killing of newborns and infants. 
And I remember one of my trips there to Israel, they said in those old ancient walls, they actually found jars with fetuses in them. Sacrificing to the gods. Oh, I'm so glad I know Jesus and I know, know the Lord and I don't serve Satan. What a horrible God Satan is. He's not a God, he's his enemy. But what he, what he asks, blood. And, and when he's done with you and even if he promised you that you're gonna be a rock star, he'll throw you in the gutter when he's done and you probably overdose. And how many times have we seen that? You can't sell your soul to the devil and end up winning. And so he actually did all of these things against all of these gods and even Balak and Balaam he wouldn't. God delivered him even from him. And then one of my favorites is Jericho. That God just knocked the walls down. And I love that verse where it says, seven other nations greater and mightier than the children of Israel, but I delivered them into your hand. Seven nations greater and mightier than you, and I gave them to you. And then he sent the hornet. Now, I don't know what that is. Commentaries had all different opinions of that. I choose to think it might just be hornets. That would be fine with me if hornets drove out armies, but it was probably something else. But he drove them out. What he's saying is I drove them out. And I looked at this, and then I went back. At the same time in my devotions, I was reading in Joshua this week, and I went back and I looked at some of these scriptures in depth, and I looked at Achan and I thought, he brought him over, gave him Jericho, and right out the chute, Achan sinned, and, and they lost 35 or 6 men in that battle because of Achan's deception and lying and hiding the cursed things under his tent. And it was a great lesson. Jericho, I can take down your enemy. Aiken, and I won't put up with sin. So when you go to fight all the rest of this land, you better know, you better obey me. It's just like, let's get these lessons clear. It doesn't just happen. I do it. And if I'm going to do it, you must follow me. God is such a great teacher. The Gibeonites made peace with them. And he had said, if people make peace with you, you can have them be serving you. They were the water carriers and the woodcutters, which was probably worked out well for the Israelites. And the Gibeonites made peace. Even though it was deceptive, they made peace. You know, the only tribe that made peace with them as far as a, a, a big city. Oh, then they were so upset, all the Canaanites, when they saw that the Gibeonites had made friends with Israel, they thought, let's just go kill all the Gibeonites. So all these kings gathered together, you know the story, and they went, they were going to go against the Gibeonites, and Gibeonites sent word to Joshua, hey, hey, we have an agreement, you better help us. <laughs> we are carrying your water and your wood. Help, we need help. And they came in, and God said, Joshua, there were many kings, I think there were five at this point, who came against them all over, all over Canaan. And the Lord said, don't be afraid, Joshua. They will all be slain before you. And man, were the next battles exciting from city to city. It was so exciting. That's when God sent hailstorms. And it said more of them died from the hail than the, the army had killed. And right after that, Joshua said, oh, Lord, make the sun stand still and the moon. We got to finish this battle on this day. And the sun stood still for a whole day. I go, how does that happen? without everybody burning up or something. I don't know about all that orbiting. And how, Did you see the sun, moon last night? Oh, my goodness. I mean, the universe is so spectacular. And God could say, I did that. But in all that, battle after battle after battle, until there were none left. And to me, the really thrilling part of all of that battle was the last place that Joshua took was the mountains of the Anakins. And who were they? They were the giants. And it had all started back when the spies came back to Moses and Israel and said, we, we can't do it. And, and there's giants. And the people just, oh, no, there's giants. We won't take it. And of course, Joshua and Caleb said, we can. God will help us. And guess what? In the end, all of those people are dead, except for Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua fought the Anakins on that day and destroyed them. I told you we could take the giants. God would do it. And Caleb, just before that, said, 
give me this mountain was the mountains of the giants. I'm gonna build my house right there. And I just think, I love it, I love it when the good guy wins. And I just, God said, I did that for you. I saw your faith, Caleb and Joshua. I did that for you. And you can take those giants because they're nothing to me. I made the whole universe. And my favorite part out of Joshua is, remember, the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. All he did for Israel, he did it because he loved them. Oh, the goodness of God, never take it for granted. If you take this for granted, you will drift. But if you are thankful, it'll keep you strong against the enemy's temptations. Be thankful. I have a little pillow on my bed. So I think my daughter-in-law gave me or her mom or something, and it says, be thankful. Now, it's a Thanksgiving time thing, but I leave it there most of the time because I need to remember that to be thankful. From the beginning of Israel's history as a nation, they owed everything to the intervention and power of God. Everything. And Joshua reminds them of that on this day. And sometimes people go, well, well, why? Why did God give it to Israel, and why did he destroy the Canaanites? And, and why did he give them this land flowing with milk and honey? It wasn't because Israel was so good. Remember I told you God wanted to kill them, and then Moses wanted to kill them because they did nothing but complain. It wasn't because they were perfect. It was because, and the scriptures tell us, the Canaanites were so abominably wicked. And Deuteronomy tells us, the nations before you, Israel, did every abomination that the Lord hates to their idols, their gods, for they burned even their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. And God was done with them. And I think you can have so many centuries of that kind of living, and God says, you're done. And he wipes out whole tribes and nations because they will not follow him. In that, does God have grace? Absolutely. Who was Rahab? Canaanite prostitute. What was the difference with her? She believed in God, and God took her out. And so if people come to you and say, you know, I'm such a sinner, God would never want me, just say, remember Rahab. God is a God of mercy and grace. You just have to come. You just have to choose him. I love what Max Licato says. He says, God will take you just the way you are, but he won't leave you that way. I think that's so great. That's great news. We're new creatures in Christ. What great things that God has done. As a Christian in the body of Christ, we are called, he said in the scriptures here, let me just read this first. So we must, so we then must keep and observe the statutes of God. In Deuteronomy 4, number 7, he said, For what great nation is there that God, that has God so near to this nation, as the Lord is, our God is to us, Israel. For whatever reason, we get to call upon him. I love that verse, Deuteronomy 4, 7. And you know what? It's for all of us, too. And I love that. For whatever reason, we get to call upon him. He is our God. And for whatever reason, we get to call upon him. And he fights for us. The one whose statues we need to keep. The one who forgives when we repent and turns our lives from darkness into light. This God is such a great God. And we need to keep praising and praising and thanking him for that. Last week, we got a phone call, and my husband's brother, Ron, is, um, has ALS, and he's in the last stages. They lose their lungs, start failing. And our sister-in-law called us and said, you better come. And so um, Don's sister and her husband and Don and I got on a plane, and we went to Charlotte. And we had this day with Ronnie, which would probably be our last day. And Ronnie loves Jesus so much. And you know what Ronnie says? He says, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for God. He's given me a wonderful life. And not everything has been perfect. He's had a good life, but it's not. But he just, he says, I am so praising for all he's done for me. He's been so good. He's done this, this, and this for me, and that for me. And 
I am so grateful for my life. I am so grateful to God for what he has allowed me to live. And he said, my only disappointment is, I, I, I think I'm going to miss the rapture. But he said, I cannot wait to go to sleep and open my eyes, because he has the kind that he'll probably go to sleep and wake up and see his face. What an awesome thought that is. And, I, and, and when you're looking at someone who's dying, it's real. I get to go to sleep. I get to wake up and I see Jesus. How incredible is that? The one who did all of this, all of this, I get to see him. We have a good God. He's a great God. Jesus said in Mark 6, he went to his hometown. And he said they wouldn't believe. They said, I was just a carpenter. Darn those, my brothers and sisters. And it said that they were offended at him. How do you get offended at Jesus? They were offended at him. And he said, because of it, I couldn't do many mighty works, remember? I don't, in my hometown. And then it says this in verse 6, Mark 6, 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Never, ever let it happen to us. When you have small faith, you present a small God to other people watching you. And God cannot work in your life. But when you see God's greatness, and, you, and you're grateful for this, and you see how big he is, and that he's made the universe. It says, by your, my creation you can find me. When you see his greatness, he's free to do great things in your life, and others are going to see it. Never let the Lord marvel at your unbelief. But let, it, let us be like those who he said who believed that he could do anything for. It says, those of whom he said, never have I seen such great faith even in all of Israel. Amen. How awesome is that? My heart and my flesh can fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I sent that verse to my sister-in-law yesterday. So the Lord has put this on my heart for you. Because his husband, his heart and his flesh are failing. And all he's thinking about is eternity. My heart and my flesh fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Tell the children, tell that next generation, that's what Joshua did on this day. Amen. Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for your word. Oh my goodness, Lord, it's so rich. And your Holy Spirit, such a great teacher. Lord, we just thank you for this. I thank you for Joshua's life. And I thank you for putting it down so that we could see. And then, Lord, I thank you for our lives and then all you've done. And even though, Lord, some of us are going through big struggles and we have harsh things that we go through and very, very painful things at times, you are our God and you watch over us and you love us and you listen to us. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. May we meditate on the miracles and may our faith be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't you just love her? <laughs> Thank you, Jean, so much. It, Don and Jean, their lives are so, so very busy with the work of the Lord, and she took time to come here and minister to us. So let's just, I know it's for the Lord, but let's. Thank you. My dear friend Carol said last night that she thought that Jean just, spoke to her, but I was feeling the same way. I'm like, I think she just, just, it was just me. It was just only me. <laughs> and I felt it whole, the whole time. So thank you so much. We love you. And we are going to head out to our lunch. I'm, I'm going to pray over the lunch. There's not a mic in there. So I'm going to just pray right now. Father God, we thank you.
Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for Jean. We pray that you extend mercy on her travels home, that her flight's on time and she's home on time, Lord, and give her sweet rest. Minister to her, Lord, as she has ministered to us. I pray that you just minister to her heart. I pray over the food. I pray, Lord, that you would bless it, that, Lord, it would nourish us, that it will give us strength, that you would bless all the conversations and that new friendships will be made over lunch, Lord. And we just thank you for all that you have done and all that you are still going to do this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen.